Your honors, ladies and gentlemen, um, I, I have to say at the beginning but I try, that I try not to swear too often, um, but uh, today I am delighted to swear uh, to receive this wonderful honor. Um, I, in listening to the national anthems, it occurred to me that probably the last time they were played together was at the hockey, the world hockey tournament, maybe when can Canadians and the Czechs uh, played against each other, although our own team in Montreal has had a lot of very famous and wonderful Czech hockey players. So, uh, so um, there's, there's a, a bond uh, that I have with Prague uh, and with the Czech Republic that is quite special. I visited here uh, the first time in 1991, uh, two years after the Velvet Revolution, and I've been here many times since, and uh, uh, I, I, I love this place. I think it's an absolutely wonderful, wonderful place. And, and I think the Czechs and the Canadians have certain um, things in common, uh, small countries up against very big neighbors, um, and I think it breeds a certain thoughtfulness and a certain view of seeing the world that's a bit different uh, than tends to be the case in our big uh, neighbors. And I think that's especially so today when Canada has just put in a government that is rather liberal and the United States has put in a government that's not uh, quite the same, uh, to, be, uh, to be polite. Um, <laughs> Um, there is something going on in the world. Um, uh, what it is is quite evident. Why it is is not so evident. Uh, what it is is represented by the election in the United States two days ago, by Brexit, uh, by many countries that were becoming democratic one or two decades ago, now ceasing to be democratic, uh, where in fact democratically elected heads of state uh, uh, or heads of government, as in Venezuela or Russia or Turkey uh, or many other countries, uh, democratically elected and yet are not protectors of democracy. And we have to ask ourselves whether people in a democracy have the right to elect people who will undermine their, bureau, their uh, democracy. Uh, and of course, who am I or anyone else to say who has the right to elect whom? Uh, but we have to look at what's going on in the world and ask ourselves why these things are happening. What exactly <clears throat> is going on in the world? And, um, and my short answer to that is imbalance. Um, a lack of balance, and, um, and my long answer, which became a book last year called Rebalancing Society, Radical Renewal Beyond Left, Right, and Center, uh, began in this city uh, 25 years ago. Uh, when I visited a conference, when I visited and spoke at a conference called East Meets West, just after the Velvet Revolution, just after the fall of communist states all over Eastern Europe. Um, and, uh, um, and I listened to colleagues at that conference, uh, particularly economists, uh, talking about how the Czech, or Czechoslovakia then, I guess, uh, uh, how Czechoslovakia could um, uh, speed up, hurry up, and, and embrace free enterprise. Um, and in the air, in those days, particularly in the Western uh, democracies that were successful, was the conclusion that with the fall of communism in Eastern Europe, uh, capitalism had triumphed. This was the triumph of capitalism. And, and, and when I came here, even at that point, I said, this doesn't sound right to me. This is not the triumph of capitalism at all. It's the triumph of balance, that the Eastern European countries, uh, without exception, slight exception in Yugoslavia maybe, but the Eastern European countries were out of balance on the side of their public sectors. Um, there were three sectors in society, not two. Uh, 
Uh, there's the public and private sector, which we know about, and there's a third sector I'll talk about in a few minutes called the plural sector, or you know it by civil society or not-for-profits or NGOs or, or, or whatever it is. Uh, the plural sector was extremely weak in, uh, in Eastern Europe. In fact, to this day, the Chinese government, as well as the Russian government, uh, do, what, do what they can to suppress uh, the forces of the plural sector as challenges to their, uh, to their uh, power. Um, so the Eastern European countries were out of balance on the side of their public sectors, um, and we in the West, in the, in the successful countries of the West, balanced our power across public, private, and plural sectors. We certainly didn't suppress our plural sectors, uh, our public sectors, our private sectors were strong. Business in Canada or the United States or France or Britain or Germany uh, were strong in West Germany, were strong in those days. Um, uh, but our governments were strong in those days, much stronger than they are today with respect to what they were able to do. For example, people don't remember that Lyndon Johnson uh, developed all kinds of welfare programs for poor Americans, which would be impossible today. Uh, tax rates in the United States and other countries in Canada were extremely high on wealthy people. Uh, and corporate tax rates were much higher. Um, so capitalism didn't triumph at all. Balance triumphed. We had capitalism and we had strong capitalism, um, but we also had strong government and we had strong plural sectors. But the belief that capitalism had triumphed has been throwing the world out of balance ever since on the side of capitalism and on the side of private sector forces. So today, uh, capitalism has triumphed. And I think that's behind a lot of the concerns in the world today. Uh, globalization has always been viewed, uh, basically from uh, the inception of that word, probably, has always been viewed as, um, as uh, uh, by definition, good and by definition, positive. And certainly, nobody can argue with the positive effects of free trade and so on and, and so forth. Uh, but what we have today, and I think for good reason, is a challenging of globalization, specifically because of the effect it's having not only on, on certain poor people in certain countries, uh, and by the way, I should say that Canada and Czech Republic both uh, are, have maintained a certain balance um, and, and, and are doing well. Um, but many other countries have lost that balance and the trouble is that the direction things are going are toward imbalance. Let me, let me just read you some uh, statistics uh, about the United States today. Obesity is the second highest in the world after Mexico. Income disparities are huge and continue to get worse. College education, when I grew up, uh, America was the place. It was so far ahead on the number of graduates per capita. Uh, and Canada was second, uh, as I recall, but behind. Today, the United States ranks about 15th in, uh, in college in, in graduates, university graduates per capita. Drug use, and I'm referring to illicit drugs, is high. Voter turnout, I, I haven't got the statistics on the latest election, but voter turnout has been very low and much lower than most of the developed countries. But the most shocking thing of all is that social mobility in the United States is, it has, which used to be far and away the highest in the world, people emigrated to the United States so their children would have that mobility. Uh, social mobility ranks quite low in the United States today. For example, Canada, uh, a child born in Canada is a much greater, a child born of poor parents in Canada has a much greater chance of succeeding than a child born of poor parents in the United States. This is not to say the United States is alone. It's to say that the United States is leading on tendencies that are happening all over the world all over the world. And while your country and mine are doing well, I can't speak for your country, but the pressures in my country to conform to that imbalance are extremely, extremely strong. You probably 
read last week about the trade pact between the, the European Union and Canada, where the small, it's a small part of uh, Belgium called Wallonia blocked the trade pact for fear of, uh, of, of what it would do to the, to the farmers in that region. So, so uh, and, and trade pacts that were negotiated behind closed doors uh, suddenly opened their doors to the people of Wallonia so they could no negotiate a special deal for themselves, um, which is no way to make worldwide public policy, but, that, but that's the way it is. Um, so the world is going, in my opinion, steadily out of balance in very dangerous ways. And now we face the greatest danger, I think, of all, which is the president-elect of the United States, who nobody knows this is the problem. Nobody knows what he'll do. Um, let me describe the political spectrum this way. For two centuries, politics was viewed as a straight line, a straight line between left and right, governments and markets, uh, 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 democracy, the proletariat, and free enterprise, uh, nationalization and privatization, and it can go on and on and on. We, we, we engaged in linear politics, what I call linear politics, and we're still in linear politics. We still maintain linear politics. So the right is good because the left is bad, or the left is good because the right is bad. And some countries, like France, swing like a pendulum between the two. So you get Sarkozy, and then you get Hollande, and then you go back and forth and back and forth. Other countries, like um, Obama's America, uh, are paralyzed in the center. Uh, Obama wanted to do various things. The, the uh, Congress blocked him on most of those things. Um, and so the United States experienced paralyzed politics, and France and other countries experienced pendulum politics, and most countries are experiencing pendulum politics. Uh, Germany, I think, is an exception in, in sustaining a coalition of, uh, of centrist left and right uh, interests. Um, Masaryk's uh, uh, Czechoslovakia, uh, it seems to me, was an example of balance in terms of what I'm told to be his own uh, inclinations in terms of uh, what he wouldn't then have called the plural sector, uh, but in terms of that sector and the balance in society. And, and, and it seems to me that the Czechoslovakia maintained uh, that kind of, uh, that kind of uh, balance to a certain extent and became, uh, if not just the richest country in Europe, possibly one of the richest countries in the world in the 30s. Um, and then came the isms, uh, first fascism uh, from the Nazi uh, uh, government in Germany, then communism, um, and now there's a kind of a neoliberalism, which so far so good, although in Hungary I don't think they'd be saying that today. Uh, and in America, they're not saying that today. So, uh, so um, the, the, the way to... Um, there was, when I came in 1991 um, uh, and sort of looked around at, at what was going on, um, uh, I remember reading something that Mr. Klaus, your colleague at one point and, and president of the country, wrote about uh, the third way. He wrote this a bit later, but, but it was in the air at that point. What he called, he said, the third way, I have the quote here, but I can just paraphrase it. He said, there's no third way. The third way is the second way. Uh, there's only free enterprise or socialism. And the third way is socialism. Um, I'm not a believer in the third way. I'm a believer in a third leg of the social stool. Stool meaning something you sit on. Um, a stool that sits on one leg is obviously unbalanced. And, and that was, was communism here uh, uh, before 89, and that is, is capitalism in the United States right now. It's trying to stand on one leg. Pendulum politics, uh, as in France, tries to sit on two legs. That's no 
more stable than one leg. A stable, healthy society stands on three legs. It's not a question of a third way, it's a question of a third leg. And the, the, and the, the three legs are the public sector. No society, no decent society can stand without strong government. Uh, one of the weaknesses of the United States is the depreciation of government. Uh, a famous justice of the American Supreme Court said that, uh, said that uh, I buy democracy with my taxes. Um, uh, uh, no society can today can stand without a strong private sector leg, whether it's officially capitalistic or anything else. Uh, business is essential to any state, any government today. But so is the plural sector, and no healthy society can stand without a strong plural sector. Um, what do I mean by the plural sector? Uh, the simple definition is any institution or association. And by the way, I use the word association, which was what de Tocqueville used when he wrote about democracy in America, famously in the 1830s. Um, uh, uh, associations, any association or institution uh, that is neither owned by the government nor, uh, nor owned by private investors. Um, and so think of all the organizations you know uh, that fit that definition. Greenpeace, uh, Harvard University, uh, the most famous hospitals in the United States, the Mayo Clinic, uh, Cleveland Clinic, Massachusetts General Hospital, whatever it is, um, they're all non-owned organizations. Nobody owns them. Nobody owns Harvard. Uh, nobody owns the Economics University, as I understand it. Uh, nobody owns uh, Greenpeace. Um, um, there are also, there's also another class of, of, of or associations, namely cooperatives, true cooperatives, which are owned by their members, but not as investors. They're owned with one person, one vote, um, and, and nobody can sell their vote to anybody else. Um, and we have enormous numbers of cooperatives. You may be surprised to know that in the land of free enterprise, the United States, there are more cooperative memberships, 350 million, than there are people in the United States, which means that on average, most adults belong to at least two cooperatives. Uh, but, but the sector is invisible. It doesn't count because of these linear politics. Where do you put the plural sector between left and right? It's not in the middle. It's something else. Um, we have social initiatives of people engaging in all kinds of activities to improve the world. We have social movements, as we saw in Tahrir Square in Egypt, where people are trying to change their government and so on. All of that is plural sector activity. Um, and, and my argument is that a healthy society balances on those three legs. Um, uh, and uh, um, it's widely believed now that something has to change. The most popular solution is what I call adjectival capitalism. Um, there are many people who believe that if business gets it right, if business becomes socially responsible, uh, then the problems will be solved. Um, I call it adjectival capitalism because I have a collection of about eight or ten adjectives. Caring capitalism, sustainable capitalism. Uh, the, the, my favorite is democratic capitalism because capitalism is the noun and democratic is the adjective. I think they have it reversed. Um, so so there, are, uh, there are all kinds of people who believe that and believe in corporate social responsibility and believe in a win-win scenario, which means if business starts to produce the things we need for problems like global warming, for example, manufacturing windmills and, uh, and, uh, and, and uh, uh, electric cars and so on, the problem will be solved. Um, I believe in corporate social responsibility. I believe in companies that engage in win-win activities. I think we're kidding ourselves if we think that that will overcome the amount of corporate social irresponsibility we see today. I read the New York Times every day at home in print, and, uh, and about at least once a week, often, more often, there are horror stories 
about corporate malfeasance that is actually sh absolutely shocking. Um, so it's not that business is bad at all. It's that too many businesses are taking advantage of weak government. And nowhere more so than in the global arena. Um, a, a Canadian, John Kenneth Galbraith, a famous economist, wrote a book about countervailing powers. And he said that when one power rises, another power rises to confront it. When large corporations arose, large unions arose. Um, we don't have countervailing power on the global level. We have international agencies. Almost all the powerful ones are economics, economic, uh, like the World Trade Organization and the International Monetary Fund and World Bank and OECD and so on and so forth. All of them economic. Um, and most of them spending more of their time being cheerleaders for globalization than acting as the necessary constrainers of globalization to, to introduce uh, proper, proper constraints. So for balance, we need three legs, not two. And, uh, and in government, uh, business won't do it, although I applaud what business does do, and, and I would hope it'll do much more in the future. Government won't do it because governments are too co-opted. Uh, by businesses, partly because global corporations can play governments off against each other, for example, for tax breaks. Uh, so they can move wherever the taxes are best, rather than some kind of uh, something more, more balanced. Um, imagine a city, say Prague, with weak government and no police force at all. Imagine what would happen. You don't have to imagine what would happen. You can look at Somalia or all kinds of other countries where this is, in fact, happening. And what you get are gangs that, uh, that seize part of, the, part of the city and either divide the city up for their own advantage or else battle with each other, killing people all over the city. Um, that's what we have in the global arena right now. We have weak government. The United Nations is weak government, um, and, and, and organizations like the World Trade Organization may uh, um, uh, you know, rule on trade problems, but they're hardly governments or constraints. Um, and basically, three countries that are much too powerful, uh, with the right of veto in the United Nations, China, uh, Russia, and the United States, and all the rest of us. Uh, who look on. Um, you, none of you, well, maybe a few of you, but most of you did not get to vote in the American election. I didn't get to vote in the American election, and frankly, that's as it should be in one respect, and that is whatever Trump wants to do to America is the concern of Americans and the responsibility of half the population that voted for him. So, so, uh, so I don't get to vote. Uh, if it stopped there, I wouldn't want to vote in the United States. But of course, what America does could have enormous impact on your country and my country. Uh, and we will never get to vote for the American president, but we will have to find other ways to constrain Russia, China, America, in particular, if we are to have a world that's worth living in for our children. So let me say uh, just a, a few final words about um, my trip, my two trips, two of my trips to Prague. Um, in, in 1991, I attended that conference. And then I uh, uh, spent uh, a weekend at Hotel Zwickoff in the south to visit the Zwickoff Castle and, uh, and uh, just get to see the countryside a little bit. Um, and I asked, when I was there, kind of who owns Hotel Zwickoff? Um, and they weren't really sure, um, because uh, it was part of a cooperative, but the kind of cooperative it was part of sounded more like government control than a real cooperative. So I wrote a piece called Learning In and From Eastern Europe, a short article, in which I said to the Czech people, if you can figure out what to do with Hotel Zwickoff, maybe you'll know what to do with your entire economy. And, and there are going to be a lot of unemployed economists who were planning for the government, who suddenly, with a shift to, to private sector, would no longer have jobs 
perhaps, in the government, and what do you do with all these economists? And I said, well, ship each of them out to a hotel Zvikov all over the country, bring them down from their economic statistics to one specific experience on the ground, and have them report back, tell them they can't come back to Prague until they figure out what to do with Hotel Zvikov or whatever other organization they joined. Uh, that was 1991, I published that in 1992. And then, and then uh, in 2002 or three, I think, I published another article called The Economist Who Never Came Back. Um, and this was about, I have to look up his name so I get it right. Um, anyway, it was engineer, I'm going to get this wrong, Zidak. Zidak. Engineer Zidak. He had an interesting, well, for me it was an interesting history. I'm not sure it was an interesting history for him. He was a professor here at this university. And then in 1968 he was thrown in jail for two years. And then he went and worked in Hotel Zvikov. Um, and he worked there uh, as a cook, um, and as a waiter, and as a maintenance man. I don't know what his education in the Economics University did to help him do that, but I guess he, he figured it out. And by the time I got there in 2002, uh, he was running the hotel. So I had a chance to chat with him. Um, and basically, it had become a serious cooperative. Um, uh, uh, it wasn't an, a single cooperative, it was part of the Cooperative Federation, but it sounded like it had become a serious cooperative, and, and it was in danger, he felt, of being bought uh, by German interests because it was close to the German border and it was a desirable hotel for tourism, uh, and so his feeling was it was in danger of doing that. Well, I checked recently, and it looks like the hotel is still there, still part of the cooperative, although it's rented out for management, uh, to a business that runs the hotel, but the ownership apparently remains cooperative. And, and the reason I mention this is because uh, it, when I ask about the plural sector in, uh, in the Czech Republic and how active it is, um, and, and people aren't, aren't sure, they're not sure of the term, obviously the term, but if I say civil society, better, uh, but people weren't sure uh, of how active uh, it was, and, and, and I got different opinions, but no opinion that said it's really active, the way it is in Germany, for example. I remember a story of a, uh, a Greenpeace, somebody at Greenpeace told me uh, about, a, uh, about a Greenpeace member who chained himself to a pipe that was polluting, and the police came to try and get him off the pipe, and the policeman flashed his Greenpeace card, his own Greenpeace card, to this fellow and said, please help me. After all, I'm also a member of Greenpeace. Uh, common, uh, maybe, I don't know how common, but it was characteristic in a way of Germany. Um, the plural sector, as I said, is huge. And one of the things I say when I go around the world speaking to different people is you may work for the public sector, uh, sorry, you may work for the private sector, you may vote in the public sector, but you live in the plural sector, if you go to the YMCA to work out, if you have a literature club, if you are a professor at this university, uh, um, we're all surrounded by plural sector forces. We are the plural sector. Government isn't going to solve this problem. Business is not going to solve this problem. The plural sector will not solve this problem alone, but the plural sector is required to take the initiative to stimulate government and business to do more. Uh, business people who are responsible don't need that, but lots of other businesses do, and government certainly needs to be pushed on global warming uh, and on all kinds of uh, crises. So, a kernel of an idea, a, a kernel of an idea that started in this city in 1991 has become for me the center of what I'm looking for, of what I'm doing, uh, in my life these days in terms of issues of balancing society. And, and I hope uh, that message uh, can be heard throughout the Czech Republic. Thank you.